Father, we settle our hearts as we continue today. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you for your faithful shepherding. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. What a, an undertaking to get us all home to glory, Lord. What an undertaking, Lord, from beginning to end. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the time we get to gather and look into the scripture. We pray today you would give each of us our portion, Lord. Lord Jesus, we do. In this crazy world, we're, we're assailed by information and news on the horizontal, Lord. Give us today from the vertical, Lord, what we need, what will sustain us, what will give us vision, Lord, what will heal us and set us free, Lord. Your word, Lord. And we ask you to do that, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. We have come to John chapter 7. And we'll look at the first 13 verses today where it says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, go into Judea, and thy, that thy disciples may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, but not openly, as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he's deceiving the people. Howbeit no man spoke openly for fear of the Jews. We cross now into chapter 7. Chapter 7 through chapter 10 now uh, is the Feast of Tabernacles to the Feast of Dedication. It's the last time before the crucifixion we see Jesus going up to Jerusalem. It says, after these things, no doubt the ministry in Galilee, the things that had taken place, the feeding of the multitudes, the walking on the water, the bread of life discourse. And then finally, in chapter 6, verse 66, it says, many of his disciples then went back and they followed him no more. And then the timing says, now after these things, after he's finishing his ministry in Galilee, we're introduced in large part now to his ministry in Judea and Jerusalem. And as John gives us this introduction, as he goes up now to the feast, <clears throat> he introduces it in the context of the antagonism that the Lord faces. The Jews want to kill him. His own family doesn't give him any credit. The people are arguing over who he is. And he, and he introduces into this remarkable time in Jerusalem the Savior, the Messiah, and the antagonism he faced on every front to step into that place. And it's important for us to see it because look, Christ dwells in our hearts. We have to understand as we wanna move forward, we're gonna face antagonism for a lot of different reasons. But we don't have a high priest that can't be touched with our infirmities because 
he understands our weaknesses in every way he was tempted as we are yet without sin. So we can come to him. He knows what it is to walk in human skin. He knows what it is to have his life threatened. He knows what it is to have family disowning you or giving you a hard time. He knows what it is to have the people around you arguing. They don't know which side to step on. He knows all of that. He, feel, he feels it all. And John, 90 years old, skips so many things that we have in the synoptic gospels and gives us this specifically. We're told in the second verse that it was the time of the Jews feast called the feast of the Lord in the Old Testament, the Jews feast of the tabernacles. Now, feast of tabernacles is our end of September, beginning of October. We don't set the date by the calendar because it's a lunar feast. But it's six months after the Passover. In fact, the rabbis said tabernacles was equal distance between the Passovers. And chapter six, verse four told us when they're, they're coming to the feeding of the 5,000 that the time of the Passover was at hand. So now into chapter seven, six months has gone by. We're not told what happened. Certainly on the Passover, after he fed the multitudes, he went up to Jerusalem. Did he cause more antagonism? Did he heal? No doubt he taught. We don't have any of those details. Matthew, chapter 12, the verse 17, gives us details in this six months that John just passes over. But it says he didn't go to Judea to Jewry because they were already taking, you know, making their plans how they should kill him. And it had started, and we're gonna hear about it in this chapter as we move forward. When he healed the man on the Sabbath day, chapter five, who was crippled for 37 years, he healed him and told the guy, take up your bed and walk. And then religious Jews were furious because it was the Sabbath. And who do you think that you are? And they started to make plans to kill him then. Now in this chapter, verse one, it says that they want to kill him. In verse 19, it says, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why go you about to kill me? Over in verse 25, it says there, then said some of them in Jerusalem, is it not he whom they seek to kill? We have, in fact, we have it five times between here and chapter 11, where it specifically says they wanted to kill him. So that's the environment, you know, he didn't come to condemn the world. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Every intention on his side was remarkable. He had a broken heart for this broken religious system. He loved the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they were seeking to kill him. This is the level of antagonism that he's facing, that many of our brethren around the world are facing today. So after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He spent time in Galilee, for he would not go up to Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, by the way, some Christians, their favorite indoor sport is religious controversy. If, if there are Christians, if they heard somebody wanted to argue with them about something, they would be there on the spot. <clears throat> the Lord avoids that. He's moving by a different clock that's divine. He has no trouble with that. It says, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Uh, we're told in Deuteronomy in chapter 16, it says this, it says three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before him empty. They'll bring whatever gifts they can. So Tabernacles is one of the three mandatory feasts. It's Passover and under Unleavened Bread, mandatory. Pentecost, mandatory. The Feast of Tabernacles, 
mandatory. By this time, any Jewish male that lived within a 20 mile radius of Jerusalem had to be there for all three. The Jews were spread throughout the Mediterranean world, so any Jew who lived further away, they, they asked them at some point in their lifetime, at least, to get all to all three of these feasts. And certainly they're prophetic. The, the feast of Passover speaks of Christ's first coming, his dying on the cross. The feast of Pentecost speaks of, uh, of uh, first fruit speaks of Pentecost and what happened there. Um, and then the Feast of Tab Tabernacles, kind of like our Thanksgiving. It was a feast of ingathering. And it was a feast where they dwelled in booze to bring into memorial the wilderness wanderings and then coming into the promised land, which is prophetic. Uh, all of these are prophetic. It's looking forward to that day when that is realized. So they come up from all over. Josephus says it was the greatest and holiest feast of the Jews. When you watch the crowds and the people that came, eight days long, the rejoicing that took place. Josephus tells us there were 246 priests needed for, to minister for those eight days. They represented every priestly family in Israel. And there were 22,000 Levites that were at their service to help them in all of their functions. And we'll talk more about those functions as we move forward. All of the pilgrims that came up had to build booths. Today it's called the Feast of Booths Sukkah, or you know, the Feast of Tabernacles. They, they would build a booth and live in it for those eight days with their children, and they would memorialize their wilderness journey. So the tradition said the, the um, sides of the booth that you lived in had to provide more shadow than sun, the walls. They were made out of boughs, trees, branches. So the walls had to provide more shadow than sun, and the roof had to provide more shade, but still let the stars be visible so that they could lay with their children and talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the stars of heaven and what he had done. So these booths were everywhere in Jerusalem, rooftops, outside of Jerusalem, rooftops, roadsides, everywhere you can imagine these booths were built. They were everywhere. And the Jews gathered for this remarkable, remarkable feast. Now, Jesus, it says, has been staying in Galilee. Herod Antipas has jurisdiction there. And no doubt the Lord has a little more latitude there in regards to threat on his life, which, which he's going to walk into. He knows he's in God's timetable. Jerusalem is self completely hostile. He, he's not tempting God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He doesn't need to do that. So he's ministering in Galilee. Now, his brethren are going to say, what are you doing? Any Messiah worth his salt would be at Jerusalem putting the show on there. What are you doing out here in the secret parts in Galilee? Because between Passover and Tabernacles, he had gone up to Sidon. He had gone to Decapolis. He was ministering in a peripheral, peripheral even around Capernaum. He wasn't even on the main you know, thoroughfares in Galilee. He was ministering in the peripheral areas. And they're saying, what are you doing here? Why, why, you know, why are you doing that? His brethren therefore said unto him, depart you know, from, from here, go to Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Go there and see what's going on. They're saying his brethren here said that. It tells us in, math, in Matthew 13, Mark 6, other places, is not this the carpenter's son, the, the religious leader said, is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joses and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man this wisdom? And Luke, you say, this is the carpenter's son. He lived here among us. So his brethren. The interesting thing is we look at it. Look, it says, it says then down in verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe. Here's Jesus. Grew up in the house with them. If you can imagine that. 
He has four younger brothers, James, Josie, Simon, and Judah, and sisters, plural. We don't know how many. And no doubt, this, his dad's a carpenter. He's, a, he's not wealthy. When he, when he offers his offering, when Jesus is a babe but fee, fee, of de- dedication, 40 days, they offer two turtle doves instead of a lamb. It's because the law said people that were poorer could offer turtle doves. And that's what they do. So imagine at least seven children and mom and dad living in this one room place where every night they rolled out their bed places. And th- that was the environment Christ came into. He didn't say, dad, put me in a, a single dwelling you know, uh, give me a nice library somewhere. I need the quiet and the peace to get ready for the ministry. No, he, he, he comes into the midst of human life the way we know it. And for some of us, you know, we find that in that environment, sometimes our spouse doesn't want to hear what we believe. Sometimes our kids don't want to hear what we believe. Sometimes it's our parents. They don't want to hear. You know, they're religious. And all of a sudden we're talking about this Jesus thing. Sometimes it's our brothers and sisters, sometimes our our fellow employees or classmates. Understand here, Jesus steps into that on our behalf. And if you feel like, man, if I just had a better testimony, people, look, you can't have a better testimony than being Jesus, right? And he lived in that from the time they were little, they watched him. 30 years until he leaves the carpenter shop. They watched him work. They watched him pray. They watched him read God's word. They listened to him speak in the house. They knew what, you know, when Joseph died, undoubtedly, he consoled Mary. He consoled his younger brothers and sisters, half brothers and sisters, same mom, different dad. Uh, You know, and these are Tertullian, the early church father tells, these are the uterine siblings of Christ. They were all born after him to Joseph and Mary. They are his brothers and his sisters. What would it be like, gals? Can you imagine? First of all, older brothers normally should be pretty cool. Other kids should look up to an older brother. Doesn't always happen, but that's a good thing. But what would it be like to be Jesus' younger sisters? What was it like for these gals to live in the house and their older brother is Jesus? Imagine what that was like. You know, it, it tells us, for such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. They, they, they saw his character. They saw his nature. They lived in the house with him. And yet at this point, they're saying, if you say, if you are who you say you are, go on up and show yourself off in Jerusalem. What are you doing out here in the sticks? If you are who you say you are, imagine that. You know, sometimes we can be discouraged because we, we, we don't see our family one to Christ. or We, we feel like I've, I've done my best. I'm not making any progress. Jesus was with them, you know, 27 years, 28 years, you know, 20 years in the house with them, and they didn't believe. And they were with Jesus all those years. So take it easy on yourself. If your heart is to see friends and relatives and children and parents saved, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. The word of God never returns void, it bears fruit. Paul's gonna tell us in 1 Corinthians 15 that after his resurrection, he appeared to James. Acts chapter one's gonna tell us in verse 14 that when the disciples were gathered in the upper room, it says, with Mary and his brethren. They're all disciples by then. And just think what it must have been for them finally to look at each other and say, are you kidding me? I knew he was different, you know, I thought he was a goody two sandals, but you know, (laughs) he's risen. They realize your older brother is God. And he wasn't getting across, they weren't. So here's this interesting picture of his family. It says, not believers, saying you need to leave Galilee. What are you doing? Nobody does these things on the side. Go up to Jerusalem. There's no man that doth anything in secret. And he himself seeketh to be known openly. 
Now, isn't it interesting if there seems to be a little bit of uh, criticism there? If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world. And I think what's coming across there is just for each of us, there's kind of a morbid need for recognition. We kind of all kind of want that. You know, you, you preach a good sermon and somebody comes up and says, that was a great sermon. You go, oh, well, praise the Lord. You know, just say, you know, or somebody builds a, a, a cabinet for your living room. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, well, God gave me the gift to do that. And just, you know, we, we all kind of appreciate affirmation. It's good when we're raising our kids to affirm them. But there's a line somewhere where it becomes morbid. It's carnal. It's this need for recognition. A lot of that's gotten into the church. Preachers with sneakers and all this stuff. People, you know, they need to be on the spotlight. They need to be seen. They need to, hey, this is the way you need to do this so I can get out there where people will recognize me. And there's a morbidity about that. And they're not believers. And they're pushing their older brother to step out and do this right. Of course, they must be thinking, hey, he gets the kingdom. We're in there somewhere. We're part of the inheritance. He's our older brother. Whatever they're thinking, which says they didn't believe. Go show yourself to the world, they say. Then Jesus said unto them, look, my time is not yet come. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So my time has not come. Look, he's aware of a divine clock. Um, here, you know, there are times when we go through the gospel, he says, my hour is not yet come. That's different. The hour speaks specifically of the cross. But he says here, this is broader, my time, and, and we're going to see by the end of the chapter, his time did come to go up to Jerusalem. But he says here, my time, and it's keros. There's different words in the Greek for time. Keros is the right time, the opportune time. So he says to them, look, my right time is not here. Your right time is. You go up because it's always right time for you. Not always right time for me. He's aware of a different kingdom and a different clock and a different schedule and a different calendar. He's not governed by this world. He's governed by another world. And look, it's the same today. The, this world, you look at its governance, you look at its politics, you look at its economics, you look at its morality, you look at its religious systems. There's just something in this world that he could say to his brothers and sisters, they're not going to hate you. You're of this world. If you agree with that soup that's all around us, you get less agita. You know, look, he's going to say the world doesn't hate you. You're part of the world. It hates me. And it hates me because I expose it, he, he says here. He says, I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Understand, in this world, if you hate Jesus, the world loves you. If you love Jesus, the world hates you. Now, those are large categories. But if you love Jesus, means you love the scripture, you love righteousness, you love morality, you love creation, you love marriage, you love the way things the scripture says they should be. If you love Jesus, you'll keep his word. He said that. If you love Jesus, the world hates you. If you hate Jesus, the world loves you because then you're in step with it and you're in cooperation with it. The, the world hates him because he testifies of the world that his works are evil. Look, of it, not at it, not against it. He testifies of the world, not at the world, against the world. He, he had told us back in chapter 3 of John, he, he said this, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name 
of the only begotten Son of God. And this is what he said. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was testifying of it that their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth, that's what he said, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So, so Christ here is, it, look, it's, it says, he says of himself, you know, I, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. Somehow he was able to do that. And he testifies of the world, it says here, that its works, what it's doing, what's going on around us, it's evil. If you can't, as a born-again Christian, watch the news today and see so much of it you never thought you'd see 10 years ago and say, this is evil, you need to get along with Jesus in the Bible. You know, and the sad thing is there's a whole part of the church that feels like this last verse where nobody talked about them, they were afraid of the Jews, afraid of the religious system, that's all around us too. And they're afraid if I t just tell the truth about the world and how evil it is. If, I, if, I, if I'm not cool and woke, if I don't, you know, if I don't put on kid gloves, I'm going to alienate sinners. I'm not going to be able to share the love of God with them. Well, our older brother didn't have that philosophy. He says, the world hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. That's clarity, that's light. Light can't lie. When light shines on something, it's exposed. Jesus said this, he said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, the world that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. He said, I understand there's going to be the divide. And if it hated me and you're going to follow me, it's going to hate you. You don't have to be, you know, condemned. You don't have to, you know, because I did it perfectly. What you're trying to do perfectly, I did perfectly. And I loved them and I healed them and I spoke the good news to them. And I died for them. So understand, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And I'm the master. If they hate the master, the disciples have to understand the same thing is coming that way. They hate me, they hate me. If they listen to me, they'll listen to you also. If they, if, if they decided they wanted to hear what I'm saying, they're going to decide that about you as well. And guys, that's the world we live in, whether you're in school, high school, college, classmates, work, university, whatever you're doing. Whatever you're doing. There's clarity. There has to be. It's one way or the other. There's, there's no middle ground. But it's the clarity that brings people to salvation. It's not, you know, trying to camouflage it and make it palatable. It's salt, not palatable. It's light, it exposes. And understand that our master, who did it perfectly, took heat for that. And he says, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. That's just, it, first of all, it's a greater reality for many of our brethren around the world the great church in China, the fastest growing church in the world, in Iran, the Muslim world, in Africa, parts of Europe, South America, the normal experience of Christians, our brothers and sisters around the world is persecution. Here we've been blessed in so many ways. However crazy it is now, most of the church would love to have the freedom we have today, even in the insanity we're living in. We think it's, 
It's, you know, this is unusual. No, no, the church and the rest of the world knows. They hated me, they're going to hate you. But if they listen, it's because they're listening to me. They're open to me as well. The works thereof are evil, and I testify to that. Go ye up to the feast. Go not, I go not up yet to the feast. The reason my time is not yet come. His time would come, and he's aware of that. In fact, when he's before Caius and um, Caiaphas and Annas, he says, very much like he says in, in Matthew 24, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. His time's going to come. It's coming, he said to, to Annas and Caiaphas when they were threatening him, the next time you see me, it's going to be in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So he, he knows here it's coming, his time. He understands there's a divine clock and things are working the way they should work. And he says to them, you go up, go on up. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. The feast is eight days long. We don't know if they got there before it began or at the beginning. He's waiting. He's going to come up in the midst of the feast. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Notice, not openly, but as it were. It wasn't, but as it were secretly, privately, it, because these great caravans of pilgrims will come up to Jerusalem, and many of them coming from Galilee. And the crowds of people were so good. You remember when he was 12 years old, Mary and Joseph lost him and didn't know they had left him in Jerusalem because they're with family, friends, or so many people, you know, and, and they had to rush back and try to find him. So when that big, you know, caravan of pilgrims is coming from Galilee down to Jerusalem, that's where they'd be looking and watching. They knew the people from Capernaum. They knew probably some of his family, but he doesn't go with them because he wants to come up into the scene without all of that notice. So he comes down a little later. The roads are open. It seems his disciples are with him because John writes as an eyewitness here. And he came up privately then, and he entered into Jerusalem. Didn't want to tempt the Lord. Satan had said to him, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all of the kingdoms of this world and all of the glory of them. And of course, he had refused. It was a different timetable. That, that will all be his. So it says... Verse 11, then the Jews, and when John says Jews, it's always the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Sought there in perfect tense. They continued to seek him there. First day, second day, third day. They're continuing. It's the same word it says when they sought to kill him. It's an imperfect. That means continually sought, looking for the right time. Here they're continually seeking him, the religious leaders, because they know he's going to come. He's going to be there. It's one of the great feasts. So they're going through the crowds. They're seeking him. They're reporting back to each, to each other at the end of the day. Do you hear anything? Did you see him? Have you gotten any news from anybody? So that's going on. Where is he? Then here's the common people. And there was much murmuring. That doesn't happen now, but it happened in the first century. There was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. And others said, no way because he deceives the people. But on the other hand, verse 13, no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. These religious leaders were so, you know, exalted that nobody wanted to say anything they believed about Jesus because they didn't want to offend the hoi polloi. You know, they couldn't condemn him till the religious leaders condemn him. They couldn't own him as a prophet when the religious leaders didn't, so they didn't. So we were left then with these two groups. There's the one group that's saying, no, he's good. He's good. We know that. Probably one stand there saying, I had leprosy, and here I am back in the temple worshiping. He's good. 
where we were carrying my son dead to his crypt. And Jesus stopped the procession and told him to get up, and he got up. No doubt there were cripples there that had never been able to come to the temple, may never have been at the Feast of Tabernacles. So there's a, there's a consortium, there's a group of people there saying, look, he's good. He's good. Then there's another group saying, nah, he's deceiving. Right? Yeah, he did these signs of wonder stuff, but he's deceiving the people. You see, because his claims are so radical that they divide. And the same thing is true today. The claims of Jesus Christ are so radical that it divides. He said, I'm the son of God. If you see me, you've seen the father. He did miracles and signs in this day. He said that the whole world is condemned. He said he alone had come to save the world from its sins. He said, I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to rise again the third day. He said, I'm going to enter into the glory of my father, and I'm coming again in power and great glory. I'm going to take control of this world and set up a kingdom for a thousand years. And at the end of that, I'm judging all the wicked. And then a new, I'm going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And the holy city, Jerusalem, is going to be there. And my bride is going to live with me forever. But Look, you're clapping. Go tell your professor at college that. You understand? These are radical claims. And it's either one or the other. He's either who he says he is or he's a deceiver. There is no middle ground. It is impossible to be neutral. And if you're rubbing shoulders with both, it's because you're in compromise. If you're thinking, well, I'm gonna say this is cool, or I'm gonna act like that, or I'm gonna agree with the news, or I'm gonna you know, say this is okay as far as I'm concerned. You're doing all that because you wanna fit in? No, Jesus is exposing it all, making it known that it's evil, this, this world, testifying of it. That's who he is. But he does that so that he can save. He produces clarity so a decision can be made. He calls for a verdict. And his claims are so radical that no one can stand in the middle. It's either accepting by faith or rejecting, and things haven't changed. So understand, he came to walk in our skin, and there are those who want to kill him. Before this is over, there may be those who want to kill you for your testimony as there are in other countries today all around us. Understand that in his own home, and he had a better testimony about Jesus than you do because he was Jesus, right? And all of those years with his brothers and sisters, and they didn't believe. They didn't believe. They came to believe. It wasn't in vain. But don't punish yourself when you feel like, I can't reach my kids, I can't reach my parents, I can't reach my brothers and sisters, I can't reach the people I work with or go to school with. Because he was the perfect testimony, and he didn't reach all of them in, on their timetable, on his certainly things took place. And understand, in that testimony we have, there has to be the same clarity. The, the world is evil. You look what's driving it now. What is the force behind all of this? It's not political. This is not human influence in the harvest field of humanity right now. It's pure evil. Understand there are people who love that evil. It strokes them. They enjoy its pleasure and its morals. They enjoy being exalted by it. They enjoy, you know, everything it embraces. It puts no pressure on them. They enjoy its philosophies and all of that. And their time is now. They hate Christ and they love the world. If you love Christ, you're going to be hated by the world. But there's the great divide. We're living in it. There are those who say, no, Jesus. It's good. 
He's the Savior. He's the Lord. And there will be those who say, no, deceiver. You're telling me there's only one way to be saved? Deceiver. You're telling me there's only one name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved? Deceiver. You're telling me he's coming again in power and great glory and going to subdue everything? Deceiver. There's only two categories. Satan loves it when we fudge the lines, especially the believer fudging the lines. The unbelievers, they know what they believe. They don't have to fudge the lines. They're clear. You and I have to be clear. Our testimony should be in love. But it should be perfectly clear as well. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. These are, uh, this is the chemistry that's put before us as we head now into the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh chapters. Jesus, the early favor that was there in his ministry, has dissipated. Now, only among those who believe is there any favor, and they're confused. And the rest of what he's experienced is animosity and hatred, disapproval. And he's allowing us to see him, you know, this old man, John, 90 years old, putting these things to the page, and the Holy Spirit has him skip certain things and focus on certain things. So at the end, you could say, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that in believing you would have life through his name. There's purpose in all of this clarity. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand. By the way, Independence Day is, is described there in Matthew. And then shall they see, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn because of him when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Independence Day. All right? Look, and look, I love our country. I'm an American. My dad was in the Naval Department for 30 years. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But you and I know as American Christians, you know, when we'll see liberty for everyone that believes. Father, we put these things before you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the freedom we have to gather and to worship, Lord, to look into these things. Lord, let some of this stay with us today. Lord, tomorrow many of us are going to be with family, Lord. And many of us are going to be surrounded by unbelievers, Lord. Many of us are going to be brokenhearted about someone we've been trying to share your love with for a long time. Lord, may we find there, Lord, not only the power of your resurrection, but the fellowship of your sufferings, Lord. When we're with family, Lord, please, by your grace, let us remember that you were perfect and you experienced the same thing with family. And yet you continue to love. Grant that to us, Lord Jesus. We look to you and we pray in your name and for your glory. Amen.